Hello, this is Randy with Excel for Freelancers and welcome to the Lead and Prospect Manager. In this week's training, I'm gonna show you how to create this incredible Lead and Prospect Manager complete with documents, communication, a dynamic admin screen, the ability to add any type of project, complete with a fully functional Kanban, and an incredible dashboard. You're gonna be able to manage all your contacts and I'm gonna show you how to do that every step of the way. I hope you'll join us. It's gonna be an incredible training. I cannot wait. So let's get started. All right, thanks so much for joining me today. I've got a really incredible training, the Lead and Prospect Manager. Any type of sales application or any type of company who deals with sales, customers, contacts can use this and you can create it from scratch and I'm gonna show you how to do that. I'm gonna show you how I did it and you can be able to do your own or you can download this for absolutely free using the links in the description either with your email or Facebook Messenger customize it however you like i'm going to show you all the fundamentals of how i made this application so i hope you'll stick with on this incredible training now i do these for free each and every week all i ask is just a few things go ahead and click that subscribe button and we'll make sure to hit that notification icon bell that way you're going to be alerted each and every week for my new original and unique trainings with free workbook download i hope you do like these trainings i do a lot of vba but it's often intermediate to advance and a lot of people have been asking me how do i get the basic vba or how do i get intermediate vba or my skills I have no skills in VBA or they're just intermediate and I want to help. How do you do that? Now, that's just not something that I've trained before and, and I'm really focused on application development. So it's always a, um, intermediate to advance. So what I've done is I've partnered up with one of my mentors, Daniel Strong. Daniel Strong is an incredible Excel VBA guru and he's got an incredible course out called the Ultimate Excel VBA course. I saw this course. I was really, really impressed with it. And so I spoke to Daniel and I really prided and prodded him saying, can you give us a discount you know I've got some really great uh, followers who love but many of them need help with VBA what can you do for them so he's done gone ahead and give us uh, this incredible discount on this 30 hour course it's 12 sections 30 hours uh, well an amazing course that goes into every bit part of VBA even if you have no experience at all with VBA this is the course for you so I've partnered up with him he's given a great discount a ton of bonuses I'm gonna include the link down below so let's go ahead and support Daniel he's one of my mentors and uh, he helped me getting started he had courses way before I ever did so I'd uh, really like to show him some love and get on this course so that's Daniel's course uh, the ultimate Excel VBA course so I hope you'll pick that up all right so much let's get started on this training because I've got a lot to share with you we'll go over a high level overview of why it, this application is important and how you can make it your own and how you can leverage this and start creating your own applications and sell them of course my goal here is not just to teach you Excel but to make you successful with Excel and it's with applications just like this right we need to track our leads we need to track our prospect now leads are those contacts who you don't necessarily know very much they could be cold leads they could be warm leads now a cold lead is somebody that you don't know and they don't know you right so we're gonna call that a cold lead right and so what our idea is to bring them through a sales funnel starting out with cold leads and then as they get to know you like you and trust you they become warm leads and maybe they're gonna become prospects as they, they go through the funnel and then maybe you'll get the opportunity to make a proposal to them they'll approve it hopefully and then you'll be able to schedule that then it, that job becomes in progress and then it becomes completed completed and then it becomes paid so that is the sales funnel process and we can you do all of that every single step with excel in a really incredible application as we take in contacts and we put them in our contacts list we have a status right we can have status we can have an active if they're no longer a cold lead a warm lead prospect so as they go through your process it is automatic now once it becomes once they say hey please send me a proposal what you can do is you can then create a brand new project for them and if you'll take a look at this this looks very familiar this is something called invoice with profit that we have created before in a prior training I won't go into a ton of detail because it's such a massive application this week because this particular screen called invoice from profit I've changed the name changed the look a little bit but otherwise it's the same fundamentals I have an exclusive training on that I'm also going to include that down in invoice with profit invoice with profit i'll include the link down below for you to get that okay so basically what we want to do is we have a new project we can select a contact right 
and uh, we can set a default, right? What is that? Are we proposing it? Is it scheduled? So we do a proposal, right? And we call it proposal, and then we can propose. Let's say we have some kind of an auto mechanic, right? And we want to give them a proposal for an engine clean. We can give them a proposal on that date, and then uh, we can say a technician is going to do it. So one hundred dollars, right? So we can save that project, and then let's say the customer says, "Oh, you know what? That's a great idea. Why don't we go ahead and schedule that?" So you just need to change the status to schedule, and it becomes scheduled. And then, of course, as you do the work, it becomes in progress, completed, and then when they pay it, then they could just mark the amount paid. So they go ahead and pay it, and then it becomes paid, and we save that save and update that project and then our Kanban is what we're going to do when we refresh the Kanban it's going to show all that information it's going to show which projects are paid which are not paid how much is the total and it's going to show a lot of that information there as we go ahead and update so the cold leads don't have anything they become warm then they become prospects then we propose make a proposal to them and then of course we do the work we'll schedule it we make it in progress it becomes in progress and then of course we can show it completed and then as we do, as they pay it, it'll show paid and we get a total paid. So the total completed, total paid will show up here. So everything here is just set up automatically. And I'm gonna show you how to do that, of course, inside this application. Now it's a fully dynamic admin screen. What I like that is if we decide that we wanna change the color of the warm leads or something, it is a fully dynamic. Maybe we wanna change the warm leads to this darker yellow or something like that, or light green. We can do whatever we want here. Let's say we wanna change warm leads to this light yellow. All we need to do is just ref go into the Kanban, refresh that, and it's automatically gonna be fresh. So now warm leads are that thing. So it's fully dynamic. I'm gonna show you how to convert that background color to these shape colors very, very easily. It's not not a lot of coding on that one. And then, of course, we've got a dashboard. We'll be able to show the sales funnel. We're going to be able to show this particular dashboard. Of course, we're going to have some slices in here, a timeline, and we'll show you that actually timeline here. And then project status summary, how many projects are proposed, scheduled, and this is just for projects. And then, of course, we'll want to know the ever so important the customer acquisition cost. What is the actual cost of the acquisition, right? We're going to be able to track expenses as well. I didn't mention that, but that's just a little bit of a, a table. It's not a huge, big deal there. But all I do have here is a table of expenses. So I want to know what our expenses are. What is our actual cost of bringing those customers in? So we're going to go over that. That's a very important metric in applications like that. We want to know what the cost of these customers are. And basically, if we have... Uh, you know, 1,500 in sales, and we have 34 new customers. We've got a total, our customer acquisition cost is $42 per uh, customer, or 42.33 CAC customer acquisition cost, and the project summary. All right, so we've got a lot of this. If I do move fast, and I tend to do move fast, I know that I can see that. I've got some pivot data here. I'll show you. All you need to do is just slow down the video, change the video. Of course, I'll try to slow down. I do want to slow down as well, and I'll do my best to do that. But you can also slow the video down to 0.75 or you know, 0.5, and that way I'll talk slower <laughs> automatically. It'll force me to talk slower. So that might help too, because I know I get excited. I love sharing these applications with you just so much. I get excited, and I tend to talk fast okay so let's get into it let's just see how we do that we also have a really cool search by we want to search by our contacts we don't know we maybe want to know what our contacts are so maybe we want to know which jobs are in progress so we can do a search by in progress and it'll show us these four contacts are have in progress we can clear the filter we may want to search by contact name. So if we search by FR, we can search uh, by FR by contact name. So I'm going to show you how to do this dynamic search by very, very easily. And yes, just a few lines of code on this. So it's really, really a great feature. Lots to show you. So let's get into that. Okay, so we've got this feature. And of course, we're going to be able to add a new contact. We'll be adding name information here. Save the contact and of course, delete the contact. When I select a contact from this list, it is going going to load up automatically. Contacts, we'll be able to add documents for those contacts. Let's pick a, Peter Parker's got some documents. We'll be able to uh, review that document. We'll be able to see a, a, a specific thumbnail of that document if it's available. And also we are going to have the ability to add additional communications onto this. There's so many features onto this. So if we add a communication, maybe we want a phone conversation, maybe we sent an email, maybe we had an online meeting or an in-person meeting, we can do that. So all we need to do, I should probably add a date uh, calendar, date picker there on that. So we can simply add one there, like a phone meeting, and then check and it's automatically going to be saved, right? If we just want to 
add a message here, phone message, left a phone message, we can just simply select it and then save it. And it's going to update that communication. So we can keep track of the communications that we've had with that contact, a full history. It's automatically going to be supported by date. And what that means, if we enter something at a later date, right, we decide to add that. When we re-add re that contact, it is automatically going to be refreshed. So when we see it, it's automatically going to be set to the top. So that means the newest is going to be at the top. We'll be able to add documents, adding any type of document, even pictures. That's from prior training. So we can add pictures onto that. So we know we're going to have that. But to add these pictures and add these documents, we need a central folder to keep track of it. And what I want to do is I want to also be able to track them on a per customer basis. So if I take a look inside my desktop here, right, we're going to take a look. We've got two different folders. We've got one for David Davidson, one for Peter Parker. Now, Peter Parker, we just added. So we added that picture. Now, every time we browse for a picture, we're going to create a brand new folder if it has not been created for that customers. That way, whatever folder that we've selected to keep track of our contacts is going to automatically copy those documents into a folder for that customer or create one if it's not yet been created. So that we're going to be able to do and I'll show you how to do that. So documents, whatever they are, are going to be are going to be handled here. Now whether it's PDF or Word documents, we can also do that too. So if we want to add a Word document, we can add a Word document and then we can get a thumbnail and I'm going to show you how to do that as well. So let's me just browse here. So we've got a little bit of a Word document here and this Word document is going to automatically summarize and browse. It'll be kind of contorted but uh, we'll, it'll, you'll get an idea of a thumbnail of that document even if if it is a Word document. So previewing pictures, previewing PNGs, previewing PDF, we can do that all with just a little bit of code and a single click is going to do that. Okay, great. So let's get started on this and we'll go into exactly how we did it and then we'll go into the overview. Now we're going to go over every step. However, this project, we're going to skim over this because this is already detailed. It is a big application and I want to contain this in within just a few hours before my voice goes. Okay, so what do we want to do? Well, why don't we start out with this filter here? How do we create this filter? Let's go into the, some of the databases and see what kind of data makes up this. And now, as I mentioned before, we've really got two folders, right? We've got a document folder, and that's where, remember, that's where our documents are kept. And I've got an icon folder. So those are really important. Now, the reason that we have icon folders is because with these individual statuses, we can also assign an icon to that. And if you saw previously in that previous folder right about here, I had these icons, so I've got individual icons, and they're inside this folder. Now, if you like these icons and pictures and you want to set it up just like I did, I'll make these all available through our Patreon account. So I hope you'll join us on Patreon. All the resources that go into the training, along with the updated workbook, will be available on our Patreon platform. So we have that. We've got, we need to know what the names of those icons here, right? Those names match exactly the names of these icons here. So we can browse that. We need that because we're going to be showing those icons here. If you'll notice, our Kanban contains those icons. So we can, when we refresh it, it's automatically going to show those icons. And that's really important. So we need that. We also may want to not show cold leads, right? So we may want to unselect these. Forgot to show that to you too. I always forget to show you so many features. So maybe we only want to show a few different uh, types of statuses. We can do that here. We can, maybe we want to show the inactive or not show. We can do that with just a simple selection change. So, so much really cool things to show you in this application. All right, so our admin screen is going to be made up of that. We have our communication types. This is a dynamic list. We have our our project status is here. We have our advertising expenses. This is something we can build out more. In other words, I did not add a form to keep expenses. However, that's certainly something that you could add or I could add on our Patreon platform if you wanted. All we have here is just simply a table with our expenses, relatively just some basic data on that. It's going to cover it. And that's sufficient for this training. Uh, we also want to know the project details. Are we charging sales tax? What is the default sales tax rate? And what is the default status? If we create a brand new project, Project, what is the default status of that, right? Is it proposed, scheduled? So we can set that up automatically. Project type, this is something I might add in the future, but I didn't really go into too much detail on this really. I just kind of put it there as an idea. We're not really using that in this training, okay? We can browse for the individual document folders here just with the button, either with for the icon. It's just a relative macro for that. Okay, so what else do we have? I've got some pivot data. We'll be going into that before we get into the dashboard. I've got a, obviously a contact database. We're going to have 
data mapping here. We'll be going over a little bit into that, although we've done it before. If you haven't seen my video, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go over that. And of course, we've got our contact documents database. Remember, we need to keep track of documents on a per contact basis. I need to know the contact ID that that document was assigned to, the date that it was assigned, the name of the document, the type of the document. And I also need to know where's the location of that document. Where is it, right? We've created a brand new location and the associated database row. And also what I need to know is I need to know the contact communication. Remember, we have communications, the contact ID, the date of that communication, the type of that communication, some notes, and the associated row. Relatively simple expenses. We saw that already. And I've got a project list. This is our project ID, the date of the project, the contact ID. What is the, you know, each of our contacts has their own ID in our contact database right here. Contacts have their own ID, so that's important. And also the contact name, the status of that project, the total. If it was paid, what is that total paid? And also what I do is I have a project item. So these are the individual items associated with a project. Project number one contains these items here. So if I were to show you a search for a particular project, we want to see a project. Let's say project number one. I'm going to search for that and load that project. Project number one has a total of four items, right? So th that has to be stored inside another table here. And we have that available to us inside that project item list here. So that keeps track of those four items on the project list, the technician, the description, the quantity, the amount, the cost of that item, the row on the invoice this is really invoice or project row, right? 9, 10, 11, that's the rows associated with that. And then the row of the database, okay? So that's all very important. What about the items, right? We want to add items to our project, right? We need an item ID. We need the type, is it a service or an item? The name, the description, what is the default quantity, the cost, and the price? And also, we have technicians, right? That's not something, this is just available within our projects, right? So we're able to assign technicians to individual projects here by adding it here. So if we add a service type item here, like a tire change, that's a service type item. So we want to be able to add technician who's going to do that work, setting the amount rate and the cost of that labor. All right, great. So that's kind of an overview of this application. Let's start out within the context because I want to go over this filter. This is really cool. So basically what we want to do is create a dynamic filter based on whatever that is. Not only that, our dynamics are going to have a dynamic criteria. That criteria could be any one of these. Right? So all we have to do is create that. And that, of course, original data is going to come from the contact database here. So our contact, we're going to filter by one of these. So what I need to do is I need to create a link in order to do criteria. So this criteria here, we're going to run an advanced filter from all of our contacts. We have a dynamic criteria. Notice it's contacts a E3. That is the same cell as this one. So as I change E3, if we're searching by status, right, it is also going to change inside that context database. It is now E3 since it is linked. And as soon as we put it in, we have noticed we have two stars. That means we can search any type if we want to. These two asterisks on either side of E4 are going are to change that. So if I search for a particular status such as paid, what I want to do is, or maybe I just want to do pay, right? Let's say PA, right? I can search PA, right? Right? And what that's going to do, even if I don't fully do the word paid, what that's going to do inside our contact is going to search any status that contains PA. And so that way the results, this criteria will result in these results. These particular contacts have a status that contains the word PA, which I think is just paid, right? So that's paid is the only one. So it's simply going to look here and search for PA. Now, of course, if we did just P, it would go down propose in progress. It would be a lot more. So we can do that as well. We don't need to put in the full name. That is why we put the wild card before and after so that the, our search simply contains the word being contains P and A. Okay, or PA. Okay, great. So that's going to be a dynamic. Then all we need to do is have V2 through V3 inside our criteria. Our results are going to come here from X through two and then our results then all we need to do is determine the last row bring our results over into the contacts here and bring them over here now that contact id is important because when i select it it is that contact id that i need to place directly inside b but where is it located well it's located right here but how come we can't see it right that contact ID is brought in here, but we can't see it. Why can't we see it? Because we've used a very, very special custom format. If we look in the more number format, and we use 
three different semicolons here, we are not going to be able to see it. If I were to take that out and click OK, we'd be able to see it. You see, now we can see it, right? So that's a great way of hiding data if we don't want the end user to see it, but we know it is there. If I do Control Z, it is going to be hidden again. Okay, so that's a great way to do that. Three semicolons to hide it. Sometimes I used to do background. You know, you can do it same color as the background. That works too. That's just fine. Or we can do that type of formatting. Both work well. So that's how we do it. But this one, I'm using a custom background. If we look in the page layout and we delete the background, you see it's just white, right? And all we have to do to add it back in, just simply go into the background here and then add it again, working offline. That's fine. And then just clicking insert. And that's going to insert the background here. I'll include that picture in our Patreon account, of course. Great. So how do we get this really cool search feature, right? All we need to do is just simply inch some values and it's going to automatically thing. I've also tied a clear search to this so we can clear the search out. So how do we do that, right? It's very, very clear how we do that and just in a few lines of code. So let's go into that and I'm going to show you exactly how we do that. Of course, it's all going to be on change event based on E4. When we make a change to E4, that's when we want something to happen. All right. And that's going to happen inside the worksheet. So we go into the developer and Visual Basic. We're going to take a look at the worksheet event. And that's going to be based on the context. So when we take a look inside here, inside E4, right, we're focused on our worksheet change event on our context sheet. When a user makes a change to E4, then we want to run a macro. That macro is called contact list load. When we right click here, let's go ahead and go move this up here. All right, this is the macro that we're going to run and when I right click and then go to the definition we're going to see that we have inside our module called contact macros the first macro that we're going to focus on is the contact list load now the first thing we want to do of course when we do that is we want to make sure to clear out the data right we want to clear out any data that's stored in here and also I've got some hidden data here I've got some hidden data right here located inside column C if we click on here you can see in the formula bar, we've got these contact IDs here. Now, how do we hide those? Well, we can do very simply with some formatting. And how do we do that with some custom formatting? If we go into the more number formats, we see that we're going to use three semicolons. Three semicolons will hide whatever we're there. So if we clear that out, we can see that now it is one, contact ID one. If I control Z and undo that, it's going to automatically be thing, but no, I'm not going to do that. So let's go back in and set that. We've already reset that using the selection change. So custom formatting, right? All we need to do is just three semicolons right here, one, two, three, and then enter. That's going to be, I will hide it automatically. Okay, great. But how do I get this really cool dynamic filter where I can search by any name here? Let's go into that. And of course, that's going to be on that change event right here. So when I make a change, we're going to go into this is the macro that's called contact list load. The first thing I want to do is, of course, clear out some fields. When I select a specific contact, that's going to be highlighted. And what I want to do is I want to make sure that the selected row gets cleared out. That's going to use conditional formatting. If we highlight these and go into the home, we go into conditional formatting, we're going to see three different conditional formats, right? The first of which is we want that highlighted row. That's going to be based on whatever row number is located inside B4. So when we move that over here, we scroll up, we see that B4 is 7. So we know that row 7 is going to be highlighted. And then, of course, we've got also some additional rules, and that's going to be for the alternating rows. So notice this formula, mod row equals 1. This is going to be for the odd rows, and this one's going to be for the even rows. We also want to make sure that that highlighted row is always on top. If we were to move that to the bottom and then apply, we would see that we would not get the result that we want because this rule, this odd rule, is taking precedence over it. So that's why we don't see it. We want to make sure that the selected row, the highlighted row, is always on top. So we need to move that there. As soon as we do, it will show up. Great. So what I want to do is when I make a clear, clear that search result, I want to make sure that that highlighted row is automatically cleared out. To do that, I want to make sure that B4 gets cleared out. I also want to clear out the contact ID in C6 all the way through E and then down. When we can do that. That's the first thing that we're going to do. So with the contact sheet, B4, we're clearing out that highlighted row, the selected row, plus C6 to E99. We're going to clear all those contacts out. Then we're going to focus on the contacts database. It is this database where we're going to run our advanced filter. And it is this database where we're going to use our criteria. So the, we're going to determine the last row. Right. If the last row is less than four, we're going to exit the sub out. We need to make sure there's data. We're also going to run our criteria going to be based on V2 through V3. This is where our dynamic criteria comes in. Right. I've got a link. Notice we've got a dynamic header, context E3 based on the header, whatever's in the context 
E3 here, it's going to come. So if I change that to status and I move that to paid, it's only going to show those paid jobs. And it is this criteria here that we're going to show, status paid. So we're wrapping that with the asterisk so that that means any Thing that ha contains the word PAID, if I were to do just PA, that would work as well. So it'll also result in that. So PA doesn't have to be exact. And that's because we've added the asterisk before and after that. So this is going to be our criteria. We want our results to come here from X2 to X3. And then we're going to bring in, assuming that there are results, we're going to bring those results into our contacts. Okay, so let's take a look inside that inside the VBA. As we move through the VBA, we're going to determine the last row based on our context database. If it's less than four, we're going to exit the sub out. We're then ready to run our advanced filter. We're going to be from A3 through N using those header rows. And we're going to use that criteria, as I mentioned, V2 through V3. We're going to copy that range into X2. That's where we want our results to go, and we want those to be unique. Then what we're going to do is we're going to determine the last results row based on column X. If, that, if that's less than three, that means we have no results data. But however, if we do, we can then bring that directly inside our contact screen. So the contacts C6 through D in the last results row plus three. Why? Because our results start on row six however our original data starts on row three so we need to compensate for that difference so we're going to add three and we're going to bring over the data that is it that is it all right so that's how we do it but what about clearing the filter how do we quickly clear the filter i've tied a macro to this clearing the filter is just as simple because when we have it all we need to do because i've got the trigger on e4 all i need to do is simply delete or clear whatever's located in e4 and automatically it's going to run the macro clear the filter and we do that with just a single line of code here that clearing the filter all we need to do is clear the contents of e4 all right very very cool next up how do we save and update this it's this button that's tied to this button here when i run that whether it is a new contact or whether it is an existing contact we want it updated but we do need to differentiate between a new contact and an existing context. So that's an important distinction. So we've got some additional features here inside our hidden columns A and B. What I want to know is I want to know the row that is associated with this contact. And how do we know the contact ID is going to be located here in B3? As we load it, what we're going to be doing, and I'll go over the section change of it, I'm going to take whatever, whatever contact ID here is, and I'm going to place it directly in B1. Then what this B2 is going to do is going to calculate the row that that contact is located on inside the contact database. So we see that contact ID number five, Mark Mason, is located in contact row eight. If we look in our contact database here and we look at five, Mark Mason, we see that it is on row eight. So that's what I want to extract. And we can use a named range to do that. Now I've got several named ranges. We'll go over them very briefly, but we've been over them. And then also what we have is a contact ID here that's based on all the contacts using offset. That's a dynamic named range. If you want to learn the basics of that, of course, we've got that great VBA course by Daniel Strong, the Ultimate Excel VBA course. I'm including the links down below. So that will help you with these types of name ranges. I've also got contact name and a few other things. So in or if we know the contact name, we know the contact ID, then we can determine the row of it directly inside here. So we're going to wrap it on if error. We're going to match whatever's in B1, basing on the name range contact ID. We're adding three because our first contact starts on row four. And we're going to return empty if there's an error. So we know that it's row eight. So if we know that if there's a row here, then we know it's a new existing contact. However, if we get new contact, we're going to clear out B1. If we clear out B1, it's automatically going to result in an error which is going to create a blank space and we know that this is a new contact so we're going to use that also we're going to determine the next contact id using the max formula plus one that's all the contacts the maximum of all the contacts which is 34 plus one which is 35 if there's no date at all it will create an error so we want that to result in one and that way the next the first contact id will always be one excellent so that's how we do that so that's how we're going to differentiate so when we take a look inside this first thing i want to do is make sure that there's a contact name if i try to save a contact that doesn't have a name i do want to let the user know to make sure to add in a contact name before saving right so if i add let's say i like fred fredders ranger so what i want to make sure is that we save that contact and assign a brand new row so as soon as we save that we want to make sure the contact row and we want that brand new contact id done here so we have to differentiate between a new contact and an existing contact and we're going to use b2 to do just that 
B2 equals empty, we know it's a new contact. We're going to determine the new contact row using the first available row inside the contacts database. We're going to take that next contact ID, as we had mentioned, that next contact ID, and place it directly inside B1. I also want to take that next contact ID and place it directly in column A here. Okay, great. So once we've done that, A can take on that brand new contact ID. We're going to focus on the existing. Existing, all we need to do is extract the row from B2. For everything else, we're going to use data mapping, right? Regardless if it is a new contact or an existing contact, what I want to do is I want to save all of the data inside here. All the data in all these cells, I want to save it directly to that. So that way, if we decide to add a, a specific uh, cold lead here. What I want to do is, I think this is the default. When I click new contact, I'm going to update that. It should say status, right? I need to make sure that the default brand new context will fix that up. New context, we want to make sure the default status goes into N5, not M. So I'll make sure when we, when we get to that macro, I'll make that update. So I want that status to show here, prospect, okay? So what I want to do is I want to map those fields N5 or I want to map H5 inside the database. So I've done that here inside the contact database. H5 here for the contact name. J5 for the office phone number. L5 and so on. N5 for the status. Data mapping, we're simply going to loop for the first all the way to the last. And then whatever is in those cells, we're going to place them in the selected row. That's how we do data mapping. And this particular will handle that. And then we're going to run a fade out message for save out message. All that does is simply loop through a timer. It takes this particular shape, contact save message. That's the shape that you saw. The same shape when I click save contact, let's select it. When I click save contact, it's automatically going to be uploaded. So it's going to get that little, let's, let's take a look at that in. So you see that fade out message? It's going to loop through that timer and slowly it's going to change the transparency and then it's going to turn it off. That's what this macro does. You can just copy and paste that macro. Contact new, here's where we need to make that fix. MN5 is where we want that default status, N5. And that's going to come from our new admin screen, but not before what we want to do. If there's any document preview, right? If I've worked on a specific, I think Peter's got some documents here. If there's a preview, that preview name's always going to be called document preview. So when I click new contract, I want to make sure that any preview, and I also should make sure that this is hidden too, doc group. I want to make sure that that is hidden as well. Okay. So we'll focus on that too. Okay. So I want to make sure the document preview is done. So when that document preview, we're going to delete that. Okay. I also want to that shape that you saw, I want to clear a bunch of cells, so we're going to do that. L11, I want to put the current date. L11 is actually our created on date. And again, we're going to set that status to in progress, right? Now when I do new contact, you see cold lead doesn't end up in M5. It ends up in N5, which is exactly where I want. New context, I want to default to cold lead. How do we know what to default it to? Well, we set that up inside the admin. It's going to be based on directly whatever is in here. That default here is going to be cold lead. I should write justify that here so it's cleared. And so this is our default, cold lead. Right, if I change it to warm lead, right, and we do in go into context and we do a new, new contact, it's going to change to warm lead. So, we want to set that default, I want to set that created on, and I want to also hide that shape there. So, dot shapes if it exists, dot shapes, and then I'm paste that in the document group dot visible equals MSO false. And there's another one I want to probably hide too, which is let's see here, I'm going to copy this and then I'm, I can't remember the name, paste that in there, and that's we have some. Uh, let's take a look at. Peter, Peter's got some data. It's this one right here. You see this group right here? This is for communication. This allows us to delete a communication or save a communication. It's this calm group. That's the one I want to hide also, right? What I'm trying to do, if I do new contact, I want this to be hidden, right? So the best way to do that is to just hide it on new. So when I paste this name in here, calmish communication group or calm group, right? Now when I click new contact, it's automatically going to be hidden. That's exactly what I want. There's no need to have those unless we've actually selected a specific row only when we select a row and I've also made sure that if we select anything else it's going to be hidden as well so that helps okay great so we've got a lot to cover here so basically that's all we need to do for new context when we load the context relatively simple the only way to load a contact is all we need to do is put that contact ID directly into B1 that's going to automatically generate hopefully if it's correct the contact row if I know the B2 contains a value I know we can load it so all I need to do is just select on a contact it's going to take whatever ID is here in B2. And so that happens on selection change, selection change event. So we're going to start out with that before we go
go into this because it's that selection change event that triggers this contact load. And that's going to happen from the context. We're going to focus on the worksheet change event, selection change event, right in the context sheet here. And we're going to be focused on this on contact selection. Now, these lines of code, this is simply going to hide that document group, that those two shapes, or hide that communication group if no matter what they select, it's going to hide it. So that's kind of helpful. Okay, so if, right, they make a selection change from D6 through E99, and we want to make sure that D contains a value, it's not empty, then what we're going to do is we're going to set that row, that target row into B4, that's going to trigger that conditional formatting. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take whatever's in C, remember that's that hidden contact ID, and we're going to place it directly in B1. Then we just need to run the macro that we're about to go over. That is the macro right here called contact load. Okay, and we're going to focus on context. Of course, we want to make sure that B2 contains that contact row. If it doesn't or is empty, we need to let the user know to please select a correct contact from the list. Exiting sub, we cannot move forward. And again, we also want to make sure that we put that into a variable, the contact row. And if there's any shape called doc preview, right, we want to delete that, clearing out all the contents of all the associated cells. Also, making sure that we're hiding the document group and the commission group. And also, if uh, I think we don't need this twice, do we now? No, we don't. Okay, so let's see. We don't need that twice. So we're going to turn off application screen updating. That's going to make things a little bit quicker. We're going to use the reverse data mapping. This time, we want to take everything from this cell, right? We're looking for that range in the first row of the contact, right? We're going to take whatever is in the contact row and the contact column as we loop through all the contents and place it directly inside. I've got a training specific on data mapping if you want to go into more detail on that because we've got so much to show you. Then what we're going to do is we're going to run a macro that's going to load any and also associated documents. We're going to run another macro that's going to load associated comments. So you see Peter Parker, of course, he has documents and he has communication. So we want to run the macro that's going to load both of those. So let's get into those macros right now the first is the load documents I want to load any documents that are associated with that now the best way to do that is to have a separate database and then inside that making sure that we have a contact ID for that right so we've got now of course Peter is contact number ID 3 he's the only one that we have with that is particular Peter Parker taking a look inside here that's contact ID number three He's the only one, so we're going to take run an advanced filter, assuming that you have many documents with many different contact IDs. We're going to run an advanced filter, and then what we're going to do is we're going to put that advanced filter right here. So I want to know everything with contact ID 3. This is simply linked to B1 of the context. That way we don't need to use VBA to add it in. We're going to get all those results. I want the results. I want to know the row number. I want to know the date, and I want to know the document name, and I want to know the type and location. I want to have all that coming inside the data. So bringing that in, then what I want to do is bring that inside. And here inside, what do I want to do? I want to take the row that's associated with it, the database row, and I want to put it directly in here. Why is that important? Because if I make a change to here, I want to make sure that that changes thing up. This We can also view that, actually. Oh, that's pretty cool. So I got a little view. I forgot to show that to you again. And we've got to delete. So if I want to delete that, yes. And you'll see this PNG, that just means it's not registered yet as that. But the other ones, this PNG shows up just fine. It's a location issue. All right, so what do we have here? Now, so we've got the database row. Why is that important? Because if you see what I just did, if I decide I want to delete it, right, I need to know what database row that we're going to delete. So that's very important. That's why this four is very, very important. And I need to know because it is that database row inside the contact doc that we're going to show delete. So now you see I deleted one. Now there's only three. I need to know what row to delete. So that's very important. So we're going to run that advanced filter. So that's all we need to do. The first thing what I want to do is, of course, low clear all the associated rows. Now, again, just like you saw inside the contacts, right, we have a highlighted row. That highlighted row is very important. So when I reload the documents, I want to make sure that the row that's associated with this is also cleared out. Now, that row is located directly on here, the selected document row, which is B16. So I want to clear that out. If I select another one, you see that's going to change. So I want to make sure that we clear B16. I also want to clear out any of the associated database rows, and I want to clear out all the data, and I want to delete any previous. So I'm going to do all of that with this. 
deleting that document preview, clearing the contents of everything B16, B18, everything. Then what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the contact docs database. We're going to run that advanced filter. And we'll move fast on this because I've been over this many times before. Determining the last row, running an advanced filter based on that contact ID, getting those results in, making sure that we have enough results. And then also we're going to loop through that. I want to sort those results. I want to sort based on the descending dates. I want to put the date up at the top. If you'll notice, right? So that means the newest one's going to appear here at the top. To do that, I want to run a sort based on the date. So taking a look inside the contact docs database, we've got our dates located right here in L3. I want to sort that descending based on L3 so that it's always the newest date is always on top. So we can do that based on the sort. We're going to clear those sort fields. We're going to base on it actually should be L3, L3 right here. L3 is that date as you can see above. I'm going to sort descending so the newest dates appear. Gonna, our range is going to be based K3 through O. And then we're going to apply that. That way we always have the newest on top. Then all we need to do is bring over the data. Now I'm going to bring over into two sections. First I'm going to bring over the rows from K and they're going to go directly inside column B. And secondly what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring over all the rest of the remaining information, the date, document type, and location, bringing that directly inside here, this information here. So we can do that with just these two lines of code here, bring over the document details and the document row here. Great, so that's it. And loading uh, the communications is almost exactly the same, just a different range in a different database, clearing the contents of the existing. Now in this case, what we did is we put the database row located right here inside, I forget where, oh, put it in S. I put it in S, right? So that database row, again, formatted with those three semicolons, you can see it up here, right? Right there but you can't see it inside here actually if you double click it you can see it which is kind of nice so you can see it but but only if you double click it now of course if you're in VBA you just securing and releasing these applications all you need to do is just lock that down making sure that user interface only which is going to allow the date the VBA to make changes but the user will not be able to make changes to those cells so we've got the row that's associated here and then hidden hidden here and we've got the information here so again we're going to do exactly the same thing as we did but this time we're focused on our contact communication we are going to simply have a link to the contacts we're going to run our advanced filter we're going to sort by date this time on k3 we're going to bring those results in there's repetition here so i'm moving a little bit quicker getting the last row running our advanced filter i2 through i3 kn2 right getting all those results making sure that we have those results if we do then we're going to sort based on that date k3 we're going to sort descending getting and we're sorting based on that range then all we need to do is bring in all of the data including in column s column s is going to contain our row number okay so that's it that's all we have to do communications but now what we want to do is we also have to update that right so i make a change you saw me do that right if i make a change or i make an addition i want to make sure to be able to update that so if i put in a date here and i select that row i want to be able to update that putting in a phone and if I click this button here, if we take a look at this, it's going to automatically save that. Okay, so if we take a look inside here, we see it's a specific macro that's been assigned to that. Right click and seeing that macro here, assigning that macro, we can see that it is that macro called communication save update. So it is this macro that's tied to that button. This is the next macro, right? We've already done the load comment. So this is the next macro in order that we want to go over. All I want to do is I want to make sure that B2 is not empty, right? That's very important. If I do a new contact, right, and I try to save it, there's no contact ID, right? So I want to make sure that we don't allow the user to save it, right? please save a contact right there's no contact associated with this so the first thing we want to do is make sure that b2 contains a contact row this will only happen when the contact is saved right so that's very important we want to make sure that there is a contact right so that way if they then now that the con now that i've selected an existing contact we can quickly and easily save any communications just by that but we want to make sure that have that so we want to make sure that that we they save a contact first before adding the communications and also what we want to do is i want to make sure that b5 does not equal empty please add the details in a communication row we need to have a selected row i need to know what row they've selected that selected row is going to be based on whatever's in b5 when i make a selection change b5 is going to take on that communication row there so b5 will happen so that happens on selection change okay selection change i also want to display this group it's going to allow us to delete or it's going to allow us to save inside with those two buttons those communications very very easily so we want to make sure that b5 contains a selected row if it doesn't we don't know what row to save so that's very important if b5 is empty we'll let the user know to please 
selected row. Okay, we can set that selected row into a long variable. And then what I want to do is I want to make sure that they have both the date and a type. Without those two things, I want to make sure that let them know. So if they try to save it without actually putting in a type, I want to let them know, please make sure to add in a date and a communication type before saving. So we need to make sure that P and Q of the selection row contain a value. So we can do that with here. P and the selected row equals empty or Q and the select row equals empty, then let the user know through a message box to make sure they add both of those in. All right, assuming that all the required fields are, assuming that the contact has been saved already, and assuming that the selected row, now we've run all of our checks already, we're ready to save the data. So what I want to do, is it a new communication or is it an existing communication? Do you remember in column S, we're saving that database row, right? So that means, let me just change that, the formula is a little bit easier for if we go into the more number formats and we just change it to custom. Let's just do general. Click OK. OK, so now we see that if we take a look inside, this one has been saved, right? But this one has not been saved, right? There's no, there's no database row associated to this, right? So we know that we need to save it, right? So what we're going to do is we know we've got the required fields. But what we need to do is, do we assign a brand new row or do we have an existing row? So we're going to check if, if S is empty. We know it's a new row. In that case, we need to assign a brand new row, which is going to be 10 inside that. So that's the first thing we want to do. So when we click Save, we know it's that 10 that's going to be assigned to that. So if S in the select row equals empty, it's a new communication. We're going to set that communication row based on the first available row inside our communication database. We're then going to set the contact ID based on whatever is B1 in column A, setting that up inside the communication, and also setting the database row. I want to know the row that's associated with that in column E. So we want to do those two things for new context. So here's contact, setting that ID and setting that row. That's for new context. Everything else could be for both existing or new. So those are the only two things we need to do. So moving on to our code. So I also want to take that brand new database row that we've got here, and I want to place it directly in column S. That's going to signal that we now have added that to the database, right? So that's it. Else it is an existing communication. Let's put in that existing communication. Okay, so if it's existing, all we need to do is simply extract the row from what's located in column S. Everything else, both the date, the communication type, and the notes are all going to get saved to the database regardless if it's new. Then we're going to run a fade out message that lets the user know that it's been saved, and that's going to be happening whether it's an existing or new. We're going to run that. Okay, so let's go ahead and reset those, right? Going back into our home, taking it from general, and going to more number formats, and setting it up with that custom three semicolons right here. One, two, three, and that's going to hide the associated row. That's what I want. Okay, saving our work now, continuing on. I also want to be able to have that message. This is just a fade out message, nothing important about that. That's pretty easy. Delete it, right? I want to be able to delete it. If I delete it here, I want to be able to clear it out. Okay, so to do that, I want to make sure it is also cleared from the, of course, communication database here. So it was here before, right? So let's just take a look at that. 10, remember 10 we had, a, had a value here. We'll, we'll add another one and we'll do it one more time so you can see it. it was kind of fast here. And then what we want to do is just delete it. So adding one in, saving it, it's going to get us that row of 10 here. Right now it's got a 10. And what I want to do is I want to be able to delete it. So to delete it, I need to know to make sure that there's a database row that is associated in column S. So the first thing what we want to do is determine that, right? First of all, what I want to do inside the delete here, if B5 is empty, then please select, right? If there's no row that's associated in B5, we can't delete do anything. So we need to let the user know. But there should always be a row because this delete only shows up when they've selected a row. So it should almost always happen. Okay, setting that variable, select a row in B5, right? Now I need to know if it's a database. But what if there's no database? It's possible, right? Let's say they add a date here and then they add a phone type and they decide, eh, you know what? I don't want, I don't want to do it. There's no database row we haven't saved yet, but let's say they want to clear it out, right? That just clears it out automatically. So we want to make sure that we're clearing it out even if it hasn't been saved. So if S is empty, then go to not save. It's just going to skip deleting the, the database, right? Delete database row. Okay, so it's just going to skip that, right? If it's if it does is contained inside the database, within the uh, contact communication database, we're going to delete that row using the entire row delete. Using this function is going to delete the row. However, if it's not saved, it's just going to skip, go from here to here. 
So then all we need to do is simply reload the communication list, right? Reloading it, all, remember we went over the macro, clears everything out and reloads it. So that's all we need to do is just reload it. It hasn't been saved yet, so no problem, right? We can skip the database delete if it has not been saved. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna hide that group, that group, that uh, save and delete, gonna hide that, and clearing out the selected row in B5. That's it. Okay, what if we wanna delete a contact? Well, it's more than just deleting the contact database row, right? We also need to delete any documents associated with that contact or any communications associated with that contact. So we need to make sure that we do all of that. And so the first thing we want to do is let the user know, are you sure you want to delete the contact, right? And then also I want to make sure that if B2 is empty, go to not save. It means it's going to skip everything. It hasn't been saved. There's no database rows that are associated. So all we can do is just skip all the way down here and then just run the macro that's going to add that contact and go to new contact, right? But if it has been saved, we need to delete it from three different databases, right? The contact database, the contact documents database, and the communications if there are any. So we need to go through each one of those accordingly. So if B2 is uh, not empty, we know there's a row associated with that contact, that database row is going to locate it, put that into a variable, and it's going to come from B2, right? So the, it's very easy to delete it inside the database, we just delete it from there. However, when we're removing it from the documents database, what we need to do is there, there could be several of those. So what I want to do is I want to run an advanced filter. I want to get those results in here, so any so documents associated with that. Then what I want to do is I want to sort based on row. So I want to sort it. I want the highest rows here and the lowest here, right? So in this case, it would be six, five, and four, six, five, and four down here. Then I want to delete those rows accordingly, starting with deleting row six, then five, then four. Okay, in that order. So that's just what we're gonna do inside this code. Determine the last row, make sure that we have data. Running our advanced filter, it's automatically, our criteria is automatically set based on the selected contact ID located in I3. Gonna have those results come through K2, right? So once we get those results, assuming that there are results getting that last row, if there's just one row, of, if there's no results at all, we're gonna go to not saved. If there's just one row of results here, we can skip sorting. There's no need to sort if there's just one row. However, if there are more than one row, we do need to sort based on the row number descending. That first row number is located in K3. I wanna sort based on descending, and I wanna use that sort range of K3 through O, and that, that's gonna be once they're sorted in reverse order, descending by rows, we can then run a loop from three to the last row, getting that variable, that row number into a variable from column K, and then deleting that row associated. We're gonna do that in reverse order for each one of those. We're gonna do the exact same thing for communications, except this time our row is located right here in N, reversing the order here from 10 to nine. We're gonna get that, and then we're gonna delete rows 10 and nine. I did it in a sample just a minute ago, so we can see that. So that's all we're gonna be doing inside the code with communications, exactly the same thing, running our advanced filter, making sure that if there's no data at all, skipping everything else. If there's one row of data, skipping the sort. I've just separated single row two, because we can't have the same macro, we can't have both single row and single row, they need to be different, so I've named them differently here. Okay, just that they give a different name, that's all. If we have just row one row of data, we can skip this sort and go to here, but if there's more than one, we're gonna run that sort. This time our sorting here, a range, is gonna be located on N3, that's the one we're gonna sort descending based on that row number, running that range, and then of course deleting each individual row in a loop. That's it, that's all we have to do. And then the last thing is just run the Mac layer, that's gonna automatically clear any of the contact details. That is it, that's all we need to do for context. Next up, we're gonna focus on the documents. How do we add a document? So we can select any type of document here if we want, no matter what it is. And then also what we wanna do is we wanna take a look at this. Then what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we can view the document, open the document, and delete it, even if it's a Word document. So if I've added a document here, and I want to see it, all I need to do is just click to click open and it's going to open that automatically. I also want to be able to preview it and then delete it on a click of a button. So how are we going to do all that? Well, that's going to be located in a module called contact document macros. So we've got different variables here, which we'll go over. Keep in mind that we have a doc file as a file dialog. I'm going to focus on the context. Remember, we don't want to be adding documents unless we've actually saved a contact first. So that is critical. B2 is going to let us know if that's empty, that contact has not been saved. What we're going to do is I'm going to make sure that we have a correct documents folder, right? All of our documents are going to automatically go into a single folder, and we've set that up inside the admin screen. It's my desktop here. I want to make sure that. That's important because what, not only that, we want to make sure that when we save the documents into a folder, we want to make sure that they're not only that, we're going to be able to create individual custom 
customer folders here and then put those documents in there. So how are we going to make that happen? Well, we can do that just by setting the document folder into a string variable. That's going to be a document folder and making sure to add that backslash. We do want to check to see if it is empty or if the document folder is empty. If not, let the user know to browse for a document folder. That's just simply going to run the macro that browses for that document. Relatively simple. Then what we want to do is just run another check. If it's still empty, even after we've given them a second chance, then we can exit the sub out. And of course, we want to assign that variable, making sure that we have that full file path, including the backslash, inside this document folder string variable. I also want to set the contact name. That's very important, located in H5 of our contacts because I want to create a folder if it has not been created based on the name of that contact. I want those individual folders with the contact name. That's going to keep things very, very organized inside your main folder. So to do that, we want to make sure to put that inside a variable called contact name. I also want to know what row the document set in the first document row. Remember, we've got a document database here and I want to set the first available row. I want to be able to add that row, making sure that we have the first available row. I also need the contact, the row associated here, right? What is the the row that we're going to be adding to it here, the first available row here. So we need to check for that first available row based on column G in the upper row. I also, here's the database row. So I need two rows, one associated for the database, one associated for on the contact sheet. So we need those two rows. And what we're going to do is we're going to set the document file to the application file dialog. We're going to use a file picker here. We need to pick a file picture. It can be any type of file at all, picture, document, folder, whatever. So we're going, to, we're going to keep it open. So we're going to let the user know with a title called Browse for Documents. Since it is any type of folder, we're not going to add any type of filter on it, right? We're going to use the wildcard, the dot in the wildcard period here. And that's going to denote any type of file. Not, you know, sometimes we use picture files where we specify this as JPEG, JPG, or GIF, or PNG. But in this case, it's any type of file. So just one file at a time. So allow multi-select, that's going to be false. If they don't select anything at all, this dot show is not going to be negative one. So if it's not, we need to skip and go to no selection all the way down here, which is just going to nothing exit out of the sub. If they do select something, what we're going to do is we're going to call that, that's going to be the selected item one, right? Is that first item that they've selected. The directory of that's going to be the file name, right? This in itself is the full file path. So right now I just want to extract the file name only, just the file name, including the file extension, and place that into a variable called file name. I also want to set the full file path Right? What is that destination path? Where do I want to copy that to? It's going to be based on the document folder, the contact name, and a backslash, and the file name. Right, That is the destination file path. That's where I want to copy it to. I also want to check if that file path is the same as the selected file path. What does that mean? That means the destination path path where you want to put it is the same as where it already is. So in that case, we don't need to copy it over anywhere. It's already in the folder where we want to put it. That's certainly possible. So then we can skip copying it over any folder. It's already in the correct folder. So we're going to go to go to incorrect folder. It's going to skip that copy and everything else. So however, if we do want to move it to the existing folder, but there already is a document with the same name inside that folder, what we need to do is we need to then delete that document. So we can do that with this, just checking to make sure it is with if the document folder, contact name in the VB directory, equals empty, right? Oh, this we're checking to make sure that we have a folder. I want to check to make sure that the folder exists, right? If the folder doesn't exist, right, it's empty, then we need to make it here using make dark contact name folder. This is going to create the folder if needed for the contact, not the year, right? That's the contact. So I want to make sure that we create it for the contact. So now we've created a folder for the contact if it doesn't exist. Now we're going to check to see if that file path does that actual file contained in the folder. If it already exists, then I want to delete it using the the kill file path. Delete it if it exists. Now we're ready to copy it from wherever they've selected the location into the folder. And we can do that using file copy. It's going to take that selected item, that original path, and send it over to the file path, which is our destination, our new path. Copy the file to the new path. That's it. That's all we have to do. Now what I want to do is I want to add information both to the database and the information down here. So I want to add the date, the document name, the type, and the location here. And I also want to make sure that we're going to be adding it inside the database located here. ID, date, document name, type, and location. So I want to add both of those things here. So we can do that here. We're going to focus on the document row. B16 is equal to the document row. That's that selected row. I want to put that inside the document row. So I want to take that document row and I'll place that select row inside B16. Remember, B16 is a document. So now we're taking it from the variable here and putting it into B16. We're going to set the document database row, right? That document number we've extracted to two rows. 
We need the database here, and we need the document row here. So the database row is going to go into column B, right? I want that, once it's saved, I want that database row to go into column B, okay? I want the date, the name, and everything else to the date. So everything else is just simply putting it in there. So we're going to have the date's going to go into column G. The document name's going to go into column H. Inside I, I want the extension, right? This is the file extension. We need to extract that file extension. So how do we get that? We can get that using the write command. And so to do that, we're going to use the write of the file path extension. We're going to use the write and the file path. And we also want to use the length of the file path minus using in string reverse. I'm going to look for that period from the right to the left. Look for the first period. When it's found, we're going to extract that. I want that location. And that's going to extract the file extension, .png, .jpg, .jpg. Uh, you know, DOCX or whatever it might be. That's going to, and then what we're going to do in the last thing is going to put in that full file path inside column J. That's going to save it for the context. However, we also want to save the docs to the documents database here. So to do that, we want to put inside A, I'm going to put the contact column A, I'm going to put that uh, contact ID inside right B through E. Uh, it's going to come from G through J. All we're going to do in one single colonic code, taking that date, name, type, and location, I'm going to place that directly inside our documents database right here. Date, document name, type, and location. Placing that there. And lastly, we just need to place F as that row there, that row. And that's going to come right here. F is going to take on that formula equals row. We're placing using a formula, not a, a fixed number, because if we delete rows above it, we want it to be automatically updated. And then also we're going to run the macro that previews the document. That's going to show that preview, and that's the macro that we're going to come up next. And that is the macro that when we select on something, we want that document to preview regardless of what it is. So all we need to do is simply select on it, and it's going to automatically update there, just like it did there. I want to set it automatically small to make sure it fits in that box. If we add a picture, I want to make sure it's regardless of the type or anything, what, whatever type of document it is, we want to make sure, even a PDF, let's pull this PDF here. And so what I want to do is I want to be able to add that PDF regardless and make that thumbnail. That is the preview. As soon as we add it, we want that thumbnail to appear here. So how are we going to do that? Well, we can, first of all, I want to make sure that any document that already exists, we're going to give it a name automatically called doc preview. I want to make sure it's deleted. And I want to make sure that we actually have a selected row, right? We need to know what row, is it this one or this one? I want to have a specific row that we're set up. So what row is that? That's going to be located in B16. So we're going to extract that, but if that's empty, there's nothing we can do. We're going to extract that and put that into a variable called document row. I also want to get the file path, that's going to be located in J. If for some reason it's empty, we're going to exit the sub. There's nothing we can do without a file path. Or also, if for some reason there's an issue that file path is incorrect, I want to make sure to let the user know to please make sure the document file path is correct, exiting the sub. If it's incorrect, this would be empty. All right, we're going to set the file type that's going to be based on column I. I want to know that extension. Why is that? Because the preview is going to be different. If it's a picture, then it's going to be look a little bit different. So let's go ahead and add a picture onto that. Or we'll use the existing logo here that we have. So if it's a picture, I want that low picture to display there. So we need to know the difference because if it's a PNG or PDF or something, I want to do determine that. So if the case is, so we're going to, you're going to select case, right? File type based on the file type. If the file type is a PNG, JPG, GIF, JPEG, BIM, then it's a picture type. In that case, what we're going to do is we're going to use insert, insert pictures, pictures, insert file path, and we're going to give it a specific name. But what if it's not, right? If it's a Word, if it's a PDF, or if it's an Excel, or if it's anything else, we're going to use objects. We're going to use something called .oleo objects, add, we're going to add something based on that file path. That's the same path. We don't want to link to it and we don't want to display it as an icon, right? We want to display it as a preview and we want to give it a specific name. It is the same name that we're going to use regardless if it is a picture or if it is an object, we're going to give it the same name. And that means we can work with it regardless. Now, once we've actually created it, we can then position it and size it accordingly. So regardless if it is an object or a picture, we can do the same thing with it. First thing what we want to do is focus on with shapes document preview. We're going to lock the aspect ratio. That means it won't get contorted. I want to set a maximum height. So if the height is greater than 120, we're going to set the height to 120. We also want to set the maximum width. So if the width is greater than 150, we're going to set the width to 150. Then what we want to do is I want to center it, right? I want to center it regardless of what it is, centering it in both vertically and horizontally inside this box here. So if we're going to center it horizontally, we need to center it between columns L and M. So to do that, we're going to set that left position. We're going to be basing it on the 
the left position of L17, but we want to add something, right? I want to add based on the width of columns L there, and I'm going to subtract the width of the shape there, and then we're going to divide that by two. That's going to set equal spacing on both the left and the right side. We're going to do the same thing with the top, but this time we're going to set the top position. We're going to add something to that based on the row 17, the top position. We're going to add it based on the height of rows 17 through 25. Right now what I want to do is I want to determine the height of these rows. And I want to subtract out the height of this. And then, although it's not much in this case, I want to separate the space between the two. And I want to divide that by two. So all we need to do is determine the height of those rows. Then I want to subtract the height of the shape. And then I want to divide that by two. That's going to set a top center position. And then just to make sure, I want to do some check. I had a few issues in some cases. I want to reset the top. If for some reason the top is less than the top, in some type of Word documents, it was getting contorted. I just want to make sure that we've set the top position. It's never more than the top position of L17. All right, so that's it. But now we have another macro. If I want to open the document, if I select on something and I want to view it, I want to open the document. And that's going to run a macro that's going to open that document. Right? In this case, it's a picture. So based on whatever the default program is your computer is set to, it is going to open that whatever document or Word or whatever it is, it's going to open it, even if it's PDF like this. This, in case it's a PDF, I want to open that as a PDF. So notice that this is a PDF, right? So I want to make sure that we're opening it regardless of the, setting the default. Let's bring that down so you can see that it is actually a PDF, right? So I want to make sure that we're opening using the default. And it's very, very easy, right? Just using a follow hyperlink and just a few lines of code. And it is that macro that we've tied to this little view button right here. This group comes up on selection change. When I make a selection change, and I'm going to show you that in a minute, I want this this group of shapes to be displayed right here because I've got two macros that are associated with this. The first of which is this document open. That's that little I, right? You see that? You see this I right here? This one right here, this macro here is tied to this button here. So if I go in here and I show the macro, we see that it's the document open, right? And so this macro, very simple. I want to make sure that B16, our selected row, is empty. Then what we're going to do is just assign it into a variable. And then we're going to use one single. We know the path. The path is going to be located right here in column J, right? So to do that, we want to make sure that we extract that uh, whatever's in J and the selected row, it's going to be 19, right? So J19 is going to let us know that location. When I open that location, I want to make sure that all we need to do is this workbook, follow hyperlink. This is the key here, follow hyperlink. And then it's going to be J and whatever the document rows. And that's going to open the document. So all I need to do is select on that, click on the macro, it's going to open that up just like that. Very, very quickly, very, very easily. Great, but what if I want to delete a document, right? If I want to delete this document, what I need to do is I need to check, is there a row, a database row associated with it? If there is, we need to delete that row and then refresh the list. So we can do that relatively easy. We're just giving them, first of all, we want to make sure that they really do want to delete it. So if they click delete, when they say no, they can get out of that. That's going to be with, are you sure you want to delete this document? If it's no, then exit the sub. Focusing on the contacts. Remember, I want to make sure that we have that selected row in B16. Without that, we can't move ahead. Document row inside a variable. Remember, I also want to get that document database row, right? I want to make a check. Let's just see. Oh, no. As soon as we add a document, there will be no such instances. There will be no such instances that we can add a document and not put a row. So we're okay with that because as soon as we click add a document, it adds it to the database. So that's fine. This will always have a row associated with it here. I'm going to extract that into a database into a variable and then just delete it from the database with these two lines of code here. This will put it in variable, whatever's in B and the document row. Then we're just simply going to delete it. Then all we need to do is just hide that document group shape, right? I, once we delete it, we can hide this group of shapes called document group. I can hide it. And then what we're going to do is just run the macro that's going to reload those documents, reload the document list. We already went over the macro. So that is it. That's all we need to do to add a document, view a document, delete a document, and of course, refresh the list. Very, very cool. Okay, so we've covered everything that we needed to here. We've covered, I, I just want to cover a few things on the selection change. The only thing we didn't cover was the selection change event. That's very, very quick on side, inside the co context here. We're going to view the selection change here. Uh, we got the context selection. On document selection here, this is the one, remember, we're making a selection here. What do we want to happen? Well, I want to put that row located in B16. I also want to show this group of shapes here, right? And I also want to preview the document. So I want to show this group. So we're going to do those few things. The first thing is, 
B16 is going to take on that row if they make a selection from G18 through K910. And of course, G needs to contain a value, right? If they select something other than that, nothing's going to happen because G doesn't contain a value. If they do, then what I want to do is I want to make sure that we've gone ahead and set the shapes. Now we're going to focus on this shape, that document group, just placing it inside column L, moving it over to the left and the top position, and then making sure to display it. That's going to display that group of shapes. Okay. Great. Now, well, also what I want to do, contact, I want to preview the selected document, right? If they make a selection here and G is nothing, right, then we can also making sure that we're previewing. I think we don't need this duplicate, right? Just to make sure it's probably a duplicate. We don't need that. We can just continue on, right? We've already, we're already inside the selection change. We don't need this. We don't need that. All we need, I think it was just a little bit of duplicate action, right? We already have all this. All we need to do is just run the document preview, right? We've checked everything else. That was fun. Just a little bit of duplication, not necessary. Next thing is all we need to do is run the macro, right? So if I make a selection change on that, we just want to run the macro that's going to preview that document. That's sufficient enough for us. That's all we have to do. Preview the document. Mac, okay, run the macro. We went over this. On communication selection, very, very the same. We want to make sure if they select on a row, if they select on anything within that range and there's nothing inside P, there's nothing we want to do. If there is, well, what I want to do is just show this group of shapes and base it on column S. So that's all we do here. Setting the target row in B5, focusing on this uh, communication group shape, placing it in column S and showing it up. And then that's all we need to do. We don't need that extra. Okay, we're good to go on that. That's on communication selection there. Cleaning up the code a little bit here. There was a lot of work on this project. So what, I started on Tuesday, finished on Thursday. So three days. So a little bit of coding while I'm, while I'm talking to you today. So I'm really happy. Thank you. Don't forget to subscribe. Click that like button. That helps out. Comment below. I'd love to know your ideas. What do you think of this training, right? What should I add more? If you're part of our Patreon community, of course, you can get your own feature fix or focus and that means if you want me to see me add a feature if I left something off or you want me to focus on something or maybe something needs to be fixed that's where our patreon community comes in hand when you join our patreon community you get that and a whole lot more so I really hope you'll join us on patreon it's a fantastic community where you can comment I respond to all the comments on there you get early bird specials you get PDF code books you get so much so much, there's a lot of great uh, benefits and opportunities there all right so continue on so we've been over right now we've covered the content contact macros, we cover contact documents. Now I'm going to cover this Kanban, right? This is a really cool thing. It takes our contacts and the statuses and it puts them directly inside this. So how do we do that? Well, just very briefly, this one we're not going over, right? But very briefly, all we do when we update this and we save it, right? Here is our contacts inside here. We have a row associated with that, our contact ID and our contact rows here, okay? So anytime I save a project here, all I want to do is update that contact based on this row, whatever the status is here. So just very briefly, inside our project macros here, we're not going to get into this. When I save an update, I want to extract that contact row from B4. And I want to update that contact based on whatever's in J4. Update the contact status with project status. And that means whatever's here located in J4, we're simply going to update the contact database right here. And that contact database based on column E, we're simply going to update the status. That's all we need to do. Of course, we can also update it from here when we save it, right? But just keep in mind that Anytime we save a project, it's going to save it in two places. It's only it's going to save it directly inside our project list here. Let's take a look inside our project. There's a lot of sheets on this one. Our project list, certainly it's going to stay, the status is going to save here, but it will also save inside our contact, okay? And it's just those two lines of code, contact. So keep that in mind that anytime a project is updated, we also save the status inside our contact. That's important, okay? So that way, when we do our Kanban, right, project list, we know that we can automatically display that based on that. So when I refresh it, automatically it's going to go to there. So if I take one of these, and also when I select on something, I can also do this. If I decide I'm going to schedule it, set that to schedule and save contact, going back to our content, refreshing it, we now see that Larry has been scheduled. You see that? Let me do that one more time. Clicking on Jerry, going to go to his, I forgot to show you that feature too. I always forget to show you features. Uh, scheduled, right? And saving it scheduled. Now we can do that through the actual project as well. Saving that contact, going back into the Kanban, refreshing. Now take a look at this. Jerry's here, but as soon as I refresh it, it's going to go up here. So I'm refreshing that 
it's now going to show up here, Jerry. Okay, so we can now quickly and easily update those particular prospects or into whatever they have been having. So we have that here, and also we again I showed you some features. So let's go ahead and take a look at this macro. First, what I'm going to show you is some selection change event, and then we're going to show you how we can do that. So all we really need to do basically is I want to loop through these. If we're going to be showing it, if we decide that we are going to be showing it, it's not selected. Like if I don't want to show the cold leads, I only want to show this. We're going to loop from 4 to 12. If this, if it's been checked, then I want to create a column for that. And it's going to be based on our columns here. So we're always going to start out in column G, right? Column G. If we see here, we know that column G is, of course, column 7. So that's what we're going to start. We're always going to loop in column 7. So we loop through these. We start out in column G and we create specific these shapes and we're going to create it from a sample. Now all we need to do is start with two different shapes. We have our header shape here, so we need to add our header shapes. The header shape is going to contain the, the icon, the, t the status type, and how many are located. Notice that we have how many, right? We have five. This is going to be a count, so we know how many count. And of course those focused on with projects, if it's a project, we want to also know the total amount of the projects, right? So how many, what total amount has been scheduled or in progress, or completed or paid. So we want some different information on these headers. It starts out with, and then, so we have our sub shape, right? Our sub shape holding down the control. We have two different shapes. Now, so we need some simple sample shapes. So that's what I have here. I've got this sample shape and I've got this sample shape. The colors and the text don't matter because they're gonna be changing, right? So we create some sample shapes. This one's called header sample and this is called contact sample or cont sample. Okay, so it is from these that we're gonna be creating these and we can automatically update that. Cool. So how are we going to do that? So we have a macro, of course, Kanban that's going to be tied to that. And so what I want to do, the first part of macro, is simply delete anything that's there and then refresh it. So let's go into this module called Kanban macros. And we have one, or actually I have two macros, but one very small one, one called Kanban refresh. This is the main one. This is the same one that's tied to this button up there. But before we get into the details of the code, basically what I want to do is I just want to take our contact database and I want to use an advanced filter as I always do and set a criteria. Now I want to take that criteria and I want to put it in here. And I want to determine all of the statuses, all the contacts with a paid status. I want to know how much their project was to the total amount of projects for that contact. And I want a total. So this means the total. So this is basically a sum of all the projects. So if it's paid, so let's take a look at the paid. That's a good one, right? So we see paid. What I want to know is I want to know the total paid. We have five projects that have been paid at 1,108. Then we have five individual projects. And so what I want to do is I want to create shapes based on these. So to get that information and data, we need to run an advanced filter. So what that's going to do is going to produce five different results, each one having contact name, the contact ID, some notes, a project amount, and so on and so forth. And I also want to do, so we're going to use this as a formula, right? This is going to form it. That formula is going to be right here. And so we have some name ranges that are going to help us with that formula. And that's going to be based on the project. So if we take a look inside the formulas, name manager, and we go into the projects here, we see that we have some different ones. We have a project contact ID. So that's the contact ID associated with that. We have the project status, right? Based on a specific status. We have a project total right here. So that's going to help us out. So if I know that I've got a contact ID here, what I want to know is the total amount of the projects for that contact ID that have been paid. So how do we do that? We do that with a formula. We're going to use the sum ifs. We're going to, we're going to sum the project total. It's going to be based on the contact ID, which is an AD3. And it's going to be based on a very specific status called whatever is located here inside AB3. That way, as we change the status, this formula doesn't need to change. I'm going to take this formula. I'm going to bring it down all the way through our results. And that way, we see automatically that Kay Hopkins paid a 50% deposit and we see that she has 294 based on a specific project. So we're bringing that down. And this way, we don't need to keep formulas in this column only when we have data. So our, it is VBA that will bring down this formula. I also want to know all of the paid projects. So this is simply a summing that column up and it's going to know the problem because this is important because this needs to be placed inside the header inside right i want to know that 1108 that's got to be placed directly in there so that's going to come directly from here 1107 75 but i just rounded it off inside this you know it's better if we round it off so how are we going to do that well again we're going to first thing we're going to do inside the macro is delete any shapes right 
keep in mind that these shapes have specific names. They're all called, let's get out of there. This one's called contact 30. It's based on the, the name and the ID, right? 30 is the ID of that contact, but they're all going to start with contact. And notice this one, these headers going to all start with the word header. Now keep this in mind. Notice our sample here says C-O-N-T, not the full word contact, right? I don't want to delete our samples. Those are very important. Our sample here says H-E-A-D, not the full word of header. So that way, what I want to do is I want to go through every single shape inside the sheet. And I want to look for only those shapes that contain the full word contact. If it, they do, then delete that shape. Or only shapes that contain the name of header and then delete that. I'm going to wrap that in on air zoom next and on air go to zero and that's going to delete all the shapes then what i want to do so i want to clear any previous results i want to make sure to do that it's always a good idea to do that so inside the contact database starting here on ad3 and all the way through ag and down just clearing any previous results we want those completely cleared out so that's going to do it here now what I want to do is I'll remember, I want to set that initial column to 7, right? As we move through the columns, that initial column, column G is 7, then we're going to move through the columns. And so that's how we're going to do it. So continuing on, that'll just grow in increment. We're going to set that icon folder, right? I want to make sure I may want icons to appear in here. So I need to know what folder those icons are located. And that's, of course, inside our admin screen right here, located here. It's also a named range called icon folder. Make sure I try to keep my... Uh, different variables here icon folder that's what it's called so we're going to set that up here icon folder equals the admin icon folder and then the backslash also one of the last row of our contact database if there's last rows less than four we're going to exit the sub out of course we cannot run an advanced filter on our contacts database if we don't have any data inside here so we need to make sure that we have data if we have data then we can run that advanced filter to do that what i want to do is then continue on so but our advanced filter is going to be dynamic right so we first have to loop through all the statuses we need to know whether the user and user wants us to show it or not so what i'm going to do is i'm going to loop again as i mentioned from 4 to 12 looking in column e does e contain a check mark or not so we can do that here for the status row right down here for the status row 4 to 12 if e doesn't equal empty right then we're going to add that column to the kanban first we're going to set that name whatever's located in d i want to set that into a variable whatever's located warmly to prospect set that into a string variable called status name then that once that is i want to set the initial left position that initial left position is going to be based on this column here column seven right so we're going to set that into a variable both the top and the left position the top is going to be based on row three right row three is going to where our first here row three here is going to be where our first one's located our header so we're going to set that as the top position our left position is going to be based on our status column which in this case is column seven so setting that initial left position once we have the left and the top position i want to set the icon name where's that icon name located now you see we're going in order right so we know if if our first one's warm lead and it's row six i'm going to go into the admin screen and i'm going to see warm lead is row nine right of column e so i know we just need to simply add three to that so we can do that here so our icon name is g and the status row plus three that's going to set that icon name our icon names are located right here in column g these names must be the exact names inside our folder right that's very very important right if we don't have that then we cannot it's impossible to do that here so we have to have those icon names here same names inside there so once we have that we've set that into that string variable called icon name i want to know the full file path that's simply the icon folder plus the icon name that is the icon full file path once we have that set what i want to do is i want to set the criteria remember i know we said set that criteria that criteria is going to come directly from here and it's going to go directly inside our contact database located right here inside ab3 once we have that criteria we can run our advanced filter so ab3 is going to take on that criteria that status name then we're ready to run our advanced filter right we're going to run using our criteria ab3 all the contacts through m and then the results are going to come directly inside ad through af i want to determine the last results row of column based on column ad if the last results row are greater than two then i want to bring down those formulas right i want to bring if it's last results row is greater than two bring it down those formulas. so taking we can do that with a single line of code it's going to be simply be ag3 through ag and the last results row dot formula equals ag1 so that's just what i have in here ag3 and the last results row formula equals 
AG1 formula. Bring down the formula, right? That formula is very good because that's going to be the project totals based on that. And that's only if the results. Okay, now what we want to do is I want to build the header shape even if there are no results, right? I still want the header shape because I want the user to see, yes, there's no results, there's no values for this. So even if we don't have any data, all right, I only want to bring down the formula if we have data, but I want to add that header regardless, even if there's no results. So what I want to do is I want to set the status quantity, right? I want to know how many were here. How many results did we have here, right? If our last results were a seven and I subtract two, I know that we have five results, right? Why is that important? It's important because I want to know the quantity. I want to put that quantity, three, two, five, whatever it is, I want to put that inside there. So and to make sure I want to put that into a variable too. So we have the quantity and I also want to know the shape text. What is the text going to be? In this case, it's going to be warm lead three, prospect two, or pro proposed five, and then, then the amount. So we need to check for that. So first thing is status quantity. Shape text is going to be the status name and a new line, line below, and the quantity. But then what I need to know is I need to know, should I add an amount? How do I know if I should add an amount? There's no amounts with prospects or warm leads or even cold leads, right? But how do I know if there's going to be an amount? Well, if you remember correctly, we have a total inside our contact database here. We've got a total. This is automatically. So it's going to be an AH2. We know if AH2 doesn't equal zero, right, then there's no total. So we can just run a check for that. If contact database AH2 does not equal zero, then what I want to do is I want to add to this shape text. This shape text, I want to add to that. It's going to be the shape text plus whatever's there already and the dash, and then I want to add in whatever's in AH2. But I want to format that based on if just here. Here's what I, I want to set a special format so that it's going to have that dollar sign format. That way, when we show that and there is a value, it's going to have this format right here, this particular format. And it's going to show that. So it's going to show that dash, but only for those statuses that contain values. So prospects, warm leads, and cold leads, of course, wouldn't have that because there's no projects associated with them. Only proposed, scheduled, in progress, completed, and paid contain those values. Okay. All right. So that's the second. So that's all we need to do. Of course, that's only if. So next up, shapes. They have a header sample. Now what we're ready to do is create this shape here. To do that, we're going to duplicate our sample. So this is going to be duplicated, and then we're going to be given a unique name. So we can do that with here. Shapes, header sample, head sample, not head dir, head sample. Duplicate, giving it that full name, header, and the column. We'll just give it a unique name. We could use almost anything, but we'll use the column because we know it's always unique. Once we've created it, we can then work with that in brand new shape. We're going to set that left position based on the left position and the top position based on the top position. I also want to set the width. I want to default that width based on that column. So we're going to focus on that. Remember, I have to call out that sheet again because I'm inside a brand new width here. So I need to call out that sheet. We're going to use it since we have a dynamic column, we need to use cells here. And we're going to, any row would do, that's fine, right? Doesn't matter the row because it's the column width that we want. And we're going to subtract it to 10. I don't want it to be that entire width. I want it to be a little bit less. And that because I want a little bit of a space between those. That way we have a nice space. So I'm going to put a little bit less than the entire column. If we use that entire, right, if I commented this out, right, you'd see that it would be the full column here. And it would just be kind of, you see the header rows are now the full column. It doesn't really look good. So that's why I've separated them to, with that 10. So that kind of looks nice. Okay, great. So to do that, now what I want to do is I want to set that color, right? I want to put a very color, but that color is going to be dynamic based on whatever color the user has set here. So we can do that with a single line of code. We know, right, we know that it's going to be located in column F, that color. is. So we can do that with just one line of code. Based on this shape, we're going to set that fill, the four color, the RGB is going to be based on whatever is in the admin column F in the status row plus three, right? Status row plus three. We know that this is row eight. We know that inside the Kanban, that one is row, whoa, I forgot what I was on. We know that, uh, let's say cold lead is on row eight. Cold lead is on row eight. So inside the Kanban, we see that cold lead is on row five. So we know we need to add three for that to get the right color. So that's what we've done here. Interior color, we want to know the interior color of that cell. That interior color, it's going to be the exactly the same as the fill four color RGB of that shape. Then what I want to do is I just want to set the text. That text, we've already built out this string.
string variable, and that is the shape text. Okay, so we've figured that out. That shape text is going to automatically go in here. Great. So now what about an icon, right? I want to add this really cool little icon inside here. We know we've got them based on a folder, and so we can add in there. So if just want to make sure that we have a correct path for that icon. So if the icon path VB directory doesn't equal empty, that means it is an accurate path that we simply want to add it. We're going to insert the pictures called the icon path. We're going to give it a specific name called header icon and the status column. Okay, also including that full word header. That's important. And then what we're going to do is we're going to set the aspect ratio to true, making sure we lock that. We're going to set the width of 13, current left position, plus 5 in the top position. What that's going to do, it's going to position a little bit down and a little bit to the right of the top edge of this shape. And that we set the icon. Very good. That's it for the icon. Then what I want to do is we're done. We are all done with the top position. So what I want to do is I want to set that shape. So we're going to set the top position is equal to the top position plus 1. I want to update the top position. And we want to do that because we're done with the header. And now what I want to do is I want to set the new top position for the first there's a macro that's tied to this we'll get into that in just a moment so i want to set the new top position based on the first card that first contact card so we're going to reset update that top position based on the current top position plus the height of that sample right i want it to be right there plus one so there's a tiny little there's a, if we zoom in here we see there's a tiny little space between those two that's why we use the plus one so that's going to set the top position for that first card so setting that up, once we have that, we can then build the card. So we can add in the contact cards. So now what we're going to do is we're going to run a loop. And that loop is going to be based on this context. So I want to row from three to the last results row. I want to add in a brand new card for every contact and putting it right here. Okay, so we can do that with here. So running that loop, contact ID is going to be located in whatever's in AD, right? This shape text is going to be based on whatever's in AE. We'll use the notes, right? So excuse me. AE, I want to know AE, that, that contact name, the shape text is going to start out with that name, AE. Then what I want to do is I want to possibly add in the total, right? But only if AG contains a value, if it does not equal zero, right? What do I mean by that? If we take a look in here, obviously there's no cold leads, warm leads, and prospects don't have any values associated with it. There's no project. But if we have associated it with a project, what I want to do is then I want to add in that amount right here. I want to add in a dash and that amount right here. But we can check how do we know if there's a value associated. We look here in AG. We see is there a value associated with this. And if there is, then we want to make sure that we're adding that in. So we can do that with the following. If AG does not equal zero, then the shape text is equal to the shape text, whatever's there, a dash, plus again, whatever is in AG and formatted it with this. Okay, so that adds the amount in. Now we are ready to add in the notes. Now we are ready to add. So now I want to add in the notes. So now I want to continue the shape text is equal to the shape text, whatever we've previously put up there, and a brand new line, the line below, and whatever is now in AF, which is the note. So I want to add in those notes to the second line. That means on the first line, first row, we're going to have the name and the amount. And the second one, we're going to have notes. Okay, so that puts the notes in there. Great. So now what we can do is we want to, now we've got all the correct shape text. We know the text that we're going to add to that shape. So we are ready to duplicate that sample and create the shape for that, just like we did with the header. But this time we're going to focus on this shape. So it is this context sample shape that we're going to be duplicating. So the shapes, contact sample, duplicate, giving it a unique name using contact and of course the contact ID, setting up the left position and the top position. And also I want to set the width again, just like we did the top card based on the column width and then subtracting 10, setting the exact same width. Filling the text frame based on that shape text, so adding in the shape text, add in shape text. And then also, again, I want to set the color just like we did before. The fill color is based on the admin column F and the status row plus three, setting that shape color. That's it. All, now we're ready for the next card, but all I need to do is update that top position based on the height of this plus whatever the current top position is. So the top position is simply equal to the current top position plus the height of the contact sample plus one. So that updates the height for the next card. So we're just going to loop through that. That's it. That's all we have to do. Then, right, once we get through the first column, once we get through that column, 
all we need to do is remember we're all first we're looping through the columns right four to twelve these are looping through those statuses we're looping through each status so once we get done to the next status what i need to do is i need to increment the column it's going to go from seven to eight so we need to keep incrementing that column we can do that with this line of code right here all the way at the bottom status column equals status column plus one incrementing that column to the right resetting that top position right when i move that column over i need to set that top position again back to that original top position based on row three and so we can do that right here top position equals row three and then again right here g3 reset that top position i also need to update that left position to the right based on the brand new status column that we've updated here we can now set the left position that is it that's all we need to do now again we saw a macro that's it for the refresh so that's the same macro that all we need is just click here and it's going to refresh great and it's the same macro that we run on selection change which we'll go over in just a minute there's one more macro i wanted to show you on this module and that is the macro that's tied to this sample shape here so when we click uh, assign macro we see that there's a macro called uh go to contact go to contact and that means when i select this one we're going to go to the contact automatically goes to the contact let me show you that one more time Paul, pam sally's clicking on here it's going to go directly to her contact how can we do that well if we remember correctly in the macro when i put the contact id here it generates a contact row here if i know the contract row i can run the macro to load that contact so the important thing is to get that contact id now, if we take a look inside our Kanban and we look at the shape here, the shape name is called contact 30. That 30 is the contact ID. So to extract that into a variable, all I need to do is remove the word contact. And then automatically we know the ID. If we take that ID, place it directly in B1, activate this sheet and run the macro, assuming that we do have a contact row, we can then load it up. And that's just what I did inside this next macro called Kanban go to contact. This is the macro that's been assigned to every single shape automatically. If we assign a macro to this shape, it is that same macro that gets, when we duplicate it, it's already assigned. So I don't need to duplicate that macro again and again and again. I don't need to do it through VBA because it's already assigned to the sample. So it, it gets automatically assigned to any shape that I use to duplicate that with. Okay, so it's very simple. Again, I wanna extract that ID. So all I need to do is remove the word contact and we can use the application caller. Just another FYI, if I try to run this macro from here, it's gonna create an error. And that is simply because there's no shape that called this, right? It's only called when we click on the shape itself. Right? So keep that in mind that, that anytime we use application caller, we always need to run it from a selected shape. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna extract the remove the word contact. We're using the replace function and replacing it with nothing. And that's gonna extract the contact. It's gonna leave us with the contact ID no matter how many digits it might be. We're gonna take that contact ID, we're gonna place it inside the context in B1. We're then gonna activate the sheep, just as I mentioned, and then we're gonna load the contact. That's it, that's all we have to do to run that macro. Very cool, there's a few more macros on selection, just one more macro on selection change. So let's get into that and take a look inside our Kanban. And we just have a little bit based on the worksheet selection change. If the user makes a selection change anywhere between E4 and E12, all we need to do is check or uncheck it based on the current value. If it's, if it's checked, I want to uncheck it. If it's unchecked, I want to check it. And so to do that, we can just check here. First of all, we're going to shut off application screen updating. That helps things go a little bit farther. If the target value equals character 252, character 252 is exactly the same as that check mark using the wingdings font. So it's the equivalent, and that way we can use the character equivalent of that checkbox. If it is currently checked, we're simply going to clear the contents. If it's not checked, we're going to simply add it. And then we're going to select another cell, and that allows us to make a multiple selections on a single cell as long as we select another cell. Then all we need to do is simply run the macro to refresh it and then turn on application screen updating. That is it. That's all we have to do is simply to select it and then it's going to run the macro based on those selections. All right, very cool. So that's the Kanban. Very, very cool. I'm glad I got to show it to you. Lastly, before I let you go, we're going to show you how we created this really incredible dashboard, right? This dashboard contains a sales funnel, a period by contact, customer's acquisition costs, and a project summary. We do that with some pivot data. So we're gonna go over this pivot data to see just how we did it. Great, as you can see, we've got some pivot data set up here. And we look at, look at pivot an analyzer. I've got one called status, right? And this is based on the status. And basically what I wanna do is I wanna create, count all of the statuses, and I wanna put them in this really cool here chart here. Now, of course, Excel does come with some sales funnels, and I just didn't like the sales funnel. If we take a look inside here, we add some additional information here. We can add in our own sales funnel, but it just was kind of 
didn't look very good, right? So if we take a look in here, we can add our own funnels, but you know, we're just, it's not very good that it looks like this kind of square, but I wanted something a little bit nicer. So all I did was I designed some shapes around that and then brought in the data using linked, right? So I want to have some linked data. So I want to make sure to link it. So I've linked it to the original pivot data results. And it's gonna be based on some filters, right? So I want to know, in fact, I don't want to show inactive. So I've hidden the inactive here. That's sorry, that's a little bit off the screen. I only want to show this information. So if we take a look inside the show field list here, we see that we have some information. What I want to do is I want to show the status right and I want to count the number so all we're doing is showing the status and counting those I want a total count and then again I just simply sort it I want to make sure that we're sorting from A to Z and sorting the multiple options right I want to sort here the, the largest to the smallest largest to the smallest make sure that then I have this linked data here this is gonna link it simply just a link using the links that I can link to that pivot data here then what I want to do is I want to create some additional shapes so I created this if we go into the dashboard and I create this shape here so I've got some individual shapes simply using the trapezoid and I colored them associated so if we take a look inside the color right just to see how we've colored that and I want to format that shape and I've given just this tri-color shape the only difference is this middle this middle one I've decided to give it a transparency of 50 percent and the left and the right one have full uh, you know no transparency and that gives it this kind of nice look and I've done that with every shape in, in inside so that's all we really need to do inside that so update that to do that and then I've done it for every shape and then I've given it a specific color that matches the color of our original insider admin screen I wanted the color somewhat close to that and then what I do is it just creates shapes on top of that so if we take a look at this you see this is based on the pivot data a4 this is based on the pivot data e4 right so we've got our pivot data information here a5 and then our pivot data e5 so that's going to keep track of it right so it's just simply linked to our pivot data here it's just simply linked to here whether it's e5 or i5 it's simply linked that that's all we need to do have the status and quantity and let's give us a really really cool look to that and that's that's how we need to do that simply just created that in a shape behind that very very simple but it's got a nice look on it i like that much better than the original okay next up we have period sales right so if we take a look here i've got period sales by contact i want to know what contact within a given period whether it's whatever quarter here or whatever period we've selected based on the timeline so i want to know the total sales so let's take a look inside again back into our pivot data and to see how we made that happen so now what we want to know is we have that information here inside here i want to know the total information and so down here we've got another pivot data information this is going to be based on the total right so what i want to know is i want to know the project right so if we take a look inside here we could get information directly from the project and the customer it's going to be based on some pivot data from the table located in the project list right so we're going to be looking for this right this is what i want to show and i want to show the information so i've created a simply just a uh, adding in this pivot table based on the data inside this project list and I brought that pivot table directly inside here inside our pivot data here at the bottom and so, so we have some filters here I want to show the date contact and the total of the ones we're going to be using now we want the contact to be in the row I want to show those contacts and I want to sum the values what I want to do I want to sum all of the values based on on the information here so based on that total right and then i also want to run some filters right based on the date right notice we had some filters based on here so we're going to add a timeline to this so we need to filter based on the date okay great so now what i also want to do is i want to show from the top to the bottom so we have the date so all i did is create a simple chart based on that just a bar chart and they're going to be based on that very very simple but we're using these date and i can of course insert a timeline if we have pivot data we have this information and we want to insert a timeline all we need to do is just insert the timeline just like this it's going to be based on the date so once we enter that timeline right we can then of course well, remove it we can add some information we can customize it based on this but what i do is i want to create a little bit of a custom if we take a look at this one it's quite different right you see this timeline it is quite different so how are we able to add that in well all we did is we use a custom so inside here if we click on the timeline here we can create a brand new we can duplicate any one and then we can customize it so this one here is a customized one i'm able to duplicate so we've given it a whole timeline i'm able to format that i'm able to give it no fill i don't want any color on that 
and I can give it information. I can give it additional information. Header, we can do that. Selection label. So all I did do is just simply go through these and format those however I wanted, giving them the right font colors, the background colors. I wanted this look. And of course, we want to make sure that we're hiding things, right? There's a lot of options with timelines, but we want to make sure that we're hiding it. So if we take a look inside this timeline, right, I've hidden a lot, right? We have a header with selected scroll bar, or I don't want to show any of that, right? I don't want to show any of that. So I just want to hide that all just by unselecting these. And it's going to give us that very, very simple, clean look, which is what I want for our timeline here. And that's it. That's all we have to do. And that way we can use it can spread it and then the data is automatically going to be shown. And again, this is just simply based on the pivot table data located in our project list. We're just summing the total projects by the customer. Relatively simple on that. Okay, next up we have another one, right? I want to know the customer acquisition cost. And this is going to come directly from our expenses, right? If we take a look inside our expenses table here, I've got expenses and I've got them, you know, we've got an expense ID, the date, the type of expense and the amount that was associated, right? So I want to keep track of all the expenses. But what I also want to know is how many new contacts we had in the period. So I want to know how many, of course, the total number of new contacts, and I want to know the total number of expenses. So we can bring that data inside the pivot data, and that's just what I've done here. So we take a look at this. What we're going to do is we're using the pivot data here. We're again, we're going to run a filter by the date here. I want to know the rows or the expense type, and I want to sum the amounts field, right? I want that, all that information in here. And then next up, let's delete that. We don't need that sample anymore. So then next up, what I want to know is I want to know the total context. I want to know how many contacts, right? So in this one, we're going to focus on our context. This is a smaller pivot based on our context. I simply want to count how many contacts we have based on the contact ID and based on a created on date, right? If I want to filter it based on a specific date, so I know how many contacts given in a, in a given period. So we can use a filter based on the date. And what that's going to do is going to put this right here, that data. And then I basically I want to simply link to that so I know the total number of contacts. And I also want to know the total number of expenses right here. It's going to be based on this amount here. So I've got the total contacts, and I know the total expenses. If I know that, it is simple division that's going to help us to know that CAC, otherwise known as customer acquisition cost. Okay, So that's going to give it to you. And then I just want to present that data inside our dashboard here. So again, I just used some text and some links. This is simply linked here. This is an actual string, just an actual text uh, field here that we're linking to the pivot data, data I8. And we're going to do the same thing here. So we know how many customers here. So if we bring this, bring this down a little bit, and we know we can select this. This is based on I6, so we know the total number of customers. If we know the total number of customers, and we simply know that customer acquisition cost based on I10, we saw the formulas. So this is a nice visual. And also what I want to know is the expenses. I want to see what's the most expenses, advertising, purchasing, equipment, and I want to put that into a nice little chart here. And that's going to come directly from, of course, our pivot chart fields based on the expense state based on the expense type and then smout we're similarly summarizing the amounts we want to show the access categories as our expense types just as we have here lastly we have the project status summary i want to know how many projects we're going to use this donut chart here and that's going to come directly from the pivot data here if we take a look in here we have projects by status right this is going to be based on of course another table our table by project so simply in this one i want to know i want to show the rows as status our access is going to be status i want to know the sum of the total values right what is the total i want to know the total projects and that's going to be total so i want to know those total projects by status and the total of those so that's how we get that information i only want to show that information here and i want to bring that directly inside our kanban so again i've created a little donut chart based directly on that data here and Rodney, we've got, of course, our schedule status category here. This is our legend here. It's going to show up and based on those colors, and I just set it to a color, right? So if I want to format those, I give it a very specific color that I want to do. That design is going to be based on that color here. So we can do that here. So we can select any color here simply by selecting the color. So I've just used this color here. This green is the one I want to use. And then, of course, we added a timeline in here too. So remember, we have that data. We added in a timeline, and we give it that timeline the same custom format as we did. So we create one single timeline custom format, and we can use the same for both the timelines. And then we just give it some labels here. So that's all we need to do. We've got a timeline. 
We've got a project status here summary. So we know the project status. And we can based on all that pivot table. Relatively simple on that one. Not a whole lot, not a very uh, technical, relatively simple dashboard. Simple, straightforward, but very, very nice and beautiful. Great, great. Now I know, of course, remember we're, as we're finishing up, right, the projects, remember the project, if you still want to see how we created this project, let's bring it over to the projects. Here, remember this Look for invoice with profit, invoice with profit. This is almost exactly the same, different color. We use blue in that training, but everything else is the same, except this is a little bit new. All I simply wanted to do was make a dynamic, a dynamic header based on whatever's located in B7. If we take a look inside B7 here, this is about the only thing that I've changed here. And all I'm going to do is I want this dynamic based on the status. And that means if I choose proposed, I want proposal. If I choose scheduled, I want to show project scheduled. And it's going to be based on this table here. So it's the only thing that I've added. All we're going to do is we're going to index this and based on a match of this. So I use an index match inside our title here in using if error. So we're going to index based on N3. We're going to match that project status based on whatever is located inside J4, which is, of course, our project status. Once it's found, I want to add whatever. If it's not found, I'm just simply going to put project in there. Okay. If there's an error, if it's blank, I'm going to put project. Otherwise, we're going to return whatever is located in here. That way, we have these dynamic headers based on that. That is really the only major change that we put inside this particular. Area. Everything else came from the invoice with profit. So you can look at that if we have that. All right. Thanks you so much. In this training, I want to share with you what we brought to you. I show you how to create this really cool dynamic lead and prospect manager complete with context, a dynamic filter so we can then filter any type of content based on anything, even a small or a little bit of a text, very, very simply clearing it out. Of course, we can add documents to that. Uh, we can view those documents. We can open those documents. We can delete those documents. We can dynamically add communications for any contact and show you how we can pull those up, saving new and deleting contacts. Also, we created this really cool Kanban board where we could show specific columns. We could show anything we want. Those columns, of course, can take on the headers, can take on dynamic content based on the number of those contacts inside that particular status, along with the total, if there's a total associated with that, and of course the custom colors based on the admin screen. And then I show you this really cool dashboard where we have four different cool dashboards, and we show you how to create a custom funnel graphic here, along with some really cool graphs and charts that we brought inside that using the pivot data, and of course some timelines, some custom timelines. All right, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to subscribe, click the like, comment below. That helps us out. If you do want to support us, a few ways to do that. I can get two 200 of my best templates uh, with the 200 zip file in a few months we'll be going we'll be getting to 250 so i'm excited for that and uh, lots of great things of course on patreon thank you so much for your continued support i really appreciate it we'll see you next week for a brand new training thanks again